I've got Susie O'Brien and Stephen Senatiempo here with me at the moment. I'm going to start with you again, Susie, because this is a Victorian issue. But your new Premier, Jacinta Allen, uh, she's landed with this sort of dead cat on her desk, hasn't she? This Commonwealth <laughs> Games bid that was, I think, it's such an embarrassing, shocking decision for the country. But she won't front up and answer questions about it. It turns out that she knew there were budgetary problems long before the public was known. And, in fact, that the, the government was getting lawyers in to find out how to get out of the contract at least a month before they told the public. Yeah, I mean, this this cat that's landed on her desk, as you call it, is certainly beginning to stink <laughs> to high heaven. And, you know, the state government, the state opposition is hammering them on this issue because this is a direct hit on the new Premier. And it's also a link that they have to the previous administration, to the Andrews administration. And, you know, two months before, um, she... She was saying, oh, we've been making tremendous progress, was the term she used. She knew that there was going to be major cost blowouts. And the people of Victoria have every right to say, why weren't you yep. telling us that you were paying lawyers at that point to try and get us out of that contract? Yeah. Oh, but nothing to see here. You know, Teflon, um, Jacinta Allen saying, oh, we're making tremendous progress. I mean... Sorry. They're just treating us hey, like idiots. Is there any chance they could revive the Games? Is this her way out to say, yeah, new Premier? Well, 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 Because they haven't got a host for the Games yet, right? Couldn't Melbourne put them on and forget the whole regional thing because it's too expensive? Melbourne, Melbourne could whack on the Games again? If there was any city that could step in at the last minute and put on these Games, it's <laughs> Melbourne. We could do it. Come oh, on. Give me a break. Sally Cap, I hope you're, <laughs> hope you're watching. Let's do it. Uh, now, Stephen, uh, you've got the bird's eye view on drug laws there in the ACT. We've mm. talked before about these very soft uh, drug laws that are coming into place in the ACT. I see even one of the senior Labor members has uh, broken ranks on that. But New South Wales is now bringing in very soft drug laws, where it's basically a two, a three strikes and you're out. Your first two strikes being in possession of small amounts of even cocaine and, uh, and um, mm. methamphetamines. Uh, and you could just get a fine. Yeah. No, 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 no charge. No, no court case. Well, they're, they're, look, I think the, the, I'll give credit to New South Wales slightly here because they are marginally tougher than the ACT's laws. So the fines are $400 as opposed to the $100 slap on the wrist you're going to get here in the ACT after the 28th of this month. Um, and uh, it is two strikes, whereas there's no strikes in the ACT. It's just every time you call... And, and, and some of them are actually trafficable uh, quantities that we're allowing here in the ACT. You get a $100 fine or police can, as they already do, uh, divert you to a... Um, uh, uh, treatment program if you need to. But uh, what this does is it basically encourages recreational drug use. What Because it, 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 it's based on the lie that anybody who has these small amounts of drugs is an addict who needs some form of treatment. When the reality is that people are now going to accept that, well, if it costs me 100 bucks if I get caught, so be it. New South Wales, two lots of 400 before you actually get the sledgehammer dropped on you might discourage some people from doing it. Uh, but I think it's just a gradual softening we're seeing right across the board uh, because of a, a, um, a view from left-wing governments that recreational drug use is a, is a reasonable pastime. Yeah, it's a gradual so softening and it's uh, it's weakness in law, law enforcement yet again and it's spreading. Um, let me get you on The Voice. Uh, you're, you're a big man for the No campaign. Uh, tell us uh, what you think about uh, the, the banks. Uh, a lot of Australians would like the banks to maximise uh, the returns they could give us or minimise the interest rates they charge us, but it turns out the big four between them have donated $7 million to the Yes campaign and... Judging by the polling, it hasn't done a hell of a lot of good. Yeah, look, I, I guess as somebody that supports the no side of the campaign, I'm, I'm happy that these companies are doing it because I, I think the average Aussie is saying, I don't want to be dictated to by um, multinational corporations and big banks on how to vote and how to think. But uh, I think most of us would rather... I'd just rather that everybody stayed out of this except for the federal government. I mean, we've got state and territory governments taking positions on this when it has nothing to do with them. We've got corporates, we've got celebrities, we've got all and sundry trying to tell us how to think and how to vote. Let us make up our own minds. Yeah, I, I look, I think everybody should be allowed to donate to whatever campaign they like, but it's a matter of how well you run that campaign. And the Yes campaign hasn't been one very run very well at all. I'll come back to that in a moment. I just want to point out those live pictures you're seeing now. This is a live feed of Gaza and, as you can see there, a number of plumes of smoke. It would be relatively early in the day in Gaza 
at the moment. So that looks like, uh, I'm speculating here, but obviously it looks like this is the result of Israeli rocket attacks into Gaza. So that's the latest uh, in Gaza. We expect more of these uh, rocket attacks from Israel into Gaza. A lot of uh, anticipation of a ground assault in the future, will be, which will be very, very dangerous for both sides indeed, as they look to eradicate Hamas from Gaza. Uh, just finally, before we wrap up this segment, Susie, your thoughts on The Voice and also this uh, survey that shows that the killer message has been that The Voice is divisive. This uh, push by the No campaign that it's racially divisive that I think is just so misleading and wrong, but that's the one that's resonating with a lot of voters. I think a lot of people are very concerned about the division that we're feeling in the community. Even in the Aboriginal community, there's a huge amount of division. And this isn't because of the voice. This is because of the voice campaigns and the way that both sides have been fighting this. One of the other issues that people um, in the No campaign, about 22%, say they're voting against the voice because of concerns that there's this spur spurious idea um, that uh, any kind of um, decision made by by Parliament can end up in the High Court, can be challenged by the High Court, and people are very concerned about that. It's not actually true. It doesn't happen that way, but there ha that is one blow that the No campaign has landed very successfully. And, you know, at this point, the last but thing... how can you the guarantee yet... that if the legislation hasn't been put in place yet? Well, All right, guys, uh, we, we're going to end this debate now because we have to get to a break. And I think no matter which side of the debate you're on, everyone's kind of glad that next week we won't be debating The Voice. So thanks so much for joining us, Stephen. Thank Great you. to see you in the flesh. Susie, we'll see you next week.